Hello everyone, welcome back to video six of our series. Today we're going to talk about Java Spring and Timeleaf. I'm going to assume basic knowledge of programming concepts such as classes, inheritance, annotations. So thus far, we've been working on a host and we've pushed our application to the host, but we've really just been working in the static folder, writing HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files. We haven't really had a chance for our server to need to restart, but here what we're going to do is add some dynamic endpoints to our server so that it will need to restart once in a while. And over the next two videos, we're going to add some dynamic functionality and data to our server. So let's go. So in our previous video, we uploaded our boots.html as well as a lot of these static files up to our server. And right now everything is running on our host, but what we want to do is increase the functionality and the dynamic behavior of our application by adding some endpoints for our servers. So what endpoints are very similar to what these static files are doing, which is actually providing some feedback when we give a request. So when we request, for example, boots.html, we're actually receiving this file. Now, what a dynamic request means is as I have other endpoints, so when I request other resources, some of these other resources might need to be dynamically generated by our server. So how we're going to do that is we're going to use the dynamic functionality of our server in order to give the response back. So general web applications have an architecture called model view controller, where the model is the code associated with our data, like classes and objects and such. And our view is the presentation to our user. Usually this is the web page itself, like HTML files, CSS, as well as JavaScript. And then the controller kind of links these two and redirects traffic between the model and the view. So the first thing we're going to do is note that in our templates folder, this is where all the views are going to be generated. So all of our view files are going to go here. So just take note of that as we add this to our application. The other thing we're going to do is go into our demo application. And so far, our demo application just says run this demo application. But in here, we want to add two more folders. So one is for the models and the other is for the controllers. Now, it really doesn't matter what we call these folders, but it just makes sense to organize them in this way because this is a controller. These are all our controllers and these are all of our models. Now, for, we're going to start with our models. So as I said, uh, models are files that allow us to be able to keep track of our data. So here we're going to create a model called users, and this is where we're going to keep all of our users data. Now in our users.java, this is going to be a class. Now classes in Java are usually objects or services or any activities that we need to perform in our application. So here, we're just going to say this is a class called users. And notice that this file has to match up with our class uh, definition. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is provide some attributes for, for these users. So I'm going to have a private string name. Uh, this, these users will also have a private uh, string password. And uh, maybe we're going to have a private int size. So you can probably imagine for different types of classes, you're going to have different attributes associated with it. Classes can also have classes, as you know. So this can actually inherit from other classes as well. So the first thing we'll do is I'm going to go to source action. So we'll do a right click and source action, and we're going to generate some constructors. So the first constructor that we're going to generate is not going to include any of my attributes. So I'm just going to click through OK. I'm going to generate another constructor, which has all of their attributes. Now, this is just for this application. You're actually going to see why I'm doing this in the next video. But for now, I'm going to create two constructors, one that doesn't take any parameters and the other that takes three, all three parameters and just assigns accordingly. Now, in addition to this, just for simplicity, I'm going to generate all the getters and setters for these attributes. Now, again, this may not be the case for your data that you're doing, right? So for example, you might not want people to, to get a password, or you might not want other classes to be able to set a password. So that might be true about your data and your class. So here, just for simplicity, I will get all the getters and setters. So notice that we can get name, we can set name, we can get password and set password and get size and set size. So we're pretty happy with this users.java. And I want you to notice as, as I save this users.java uh, users that my server automatically reloads itself. Now, the reason for that and I make note of this in the very first video, is that we had this th thing called Spring Boot Dev Tools. And what Spring Boot Dev Tools allows us to do is just exactly this. Whenever Java senses that we've changed anything in our application, it will automatically restart the server so that we don't have to. Right. So otherwise, we would have to stop the server and we would have to restart it and so on. Now, this an another uh, good thing about this is that if we accidentally type in something wrong or if something doesn't compile, there's going to be immediate feedback that tells us the server is no longer running. 
So the next step is now we're going to provide a controller. So models is uh, pertaining to the data. So we have some users that we want to keep track of. And the next thing we want to do is create a, a file in our controllers. So I'm just going to call this my users controller java and what you'll find is that usually when you have a model there will be a controller to go along with it but this is not a general rule so it's not always the case that every model must have a controller to go along with it so we're going to create a class again and this controller allows us to now be able to direct data between the models as well as our templates our views that we're going to generate later on so as a controller we're going to annotate it as controller Okay, so this annotation says that in particular, when you start up the application, this class is going to act as a controller. So it's going to listen for requests that are coming in from an external source or a client. So we're going to actually bring in this org.springframework.stereotype. Dot controller. So the next thing we're going to do is provide a get mapping. So the get mapping allows us to add an endpoint to our application. So I'm going to do a get mapping and notice that get mapping comes from spring framework web bind annotation get mapping. This get mapping, we're going to have we're going to define an endpoint. So here we're going to define users slash view. This will, in effect, allow me to be able to view the users. So the get mapping is going to be tied to a function. So we're going to do public and string. So it's going to return a string. And this is going to be called get all users. All right, and get all users for the moment is not going to take in any inputs. But in a second, I'm actually going to add something here. Now, get all users is going to return a string. And this string is going to be associated with our view. Once we're done uh, executing all of this logic, we're going to then pass it off to a view. And let's say my view is called users slash show all. So when we return this string, this users slash show all is going to correspond to where in the templates folder I'm going to be able to find the view. So this says under a folder called users, I'm going to find a file called show all. So I'm going to come over here, create a folder called users. And under the folder users, I'm going to create a file called show all. HTML. So this is the view that's going to be associated with my users controller endpoint of users slash view. All right. So in short, what's happening here is when we run our server, if we append slash users slash view, then we're going to be directed to this view. Okay. And what this show all is dot uh, HTML is going to do is it's going to cor uh, correspond to that endpoint. For now, I'm not going to do anything to it. And right now, I'm just going to generate my template HTML5 code. And right now, you might be wondering, well, what's the difference that, uh, from this than just putting it into the static folder? Well, for one thing, if we take a look at our definition of this endpoint, this endpoint is really up to us what we want to call it. Right, so we can call this endpoint whatever we want. And in, in this file, this definition of this file is a little bit hidden from the user. But that's not the only thing. In addition to this, we can actually run some logic, run some dynamic logic for us to be able to respond uh, differently in different situations. So what I mean by this is, uh, well, let's let's do a couple of things on this endpoint. So first, I'm going to S out. And by the way, S out, if we do a tab, it's going to give me system.out.println, which is how we print things onto the console in Java. So this is always a good idea just to print to the console what we're trying to do. So I'm going to I'm, I'm getting all users in this case. And at this point is probably where I want to label uh, get or we'll, we'll do a to do. And this is going to be a get uh, all users from database. Now, right now, you'll notice that we don't have a database. We have not connected a database yet, but in the next video, we'll actually connect to a database. So the code that you're seeing here is just some temporary code that I'm later going to replace with a call to a database. So right now, I'm just going to create a list. And my list is going to be from Java Util. So I'm just going to create a list. And this list is going to be of users. It's going to come from this models. Okay. So notice that as I click on this automatically, it does the import for me. So you just got to make sure that these imports are correct. So I'm going to call these uh, my users. Okay. So users uh, list. And I'm going to create a new array list. And array list is going to come from the Java Util. Okay. All right. So now I've created a new array list of users, and now I can add some users here. So, so I'm going to do users.add, and now what I can do is add some new users to this list. So I'm just going to do a new users, and I'm going to give it uh, the name. So start with the name, and then the second parameter was the password. So let's say my password is 1234, and then we're going to give it a size. So let's say my size is 25. 
So let's repeat this process with uh, a bunch of users. So let's do like maybe four users. So I'm going to have another user called Sarah and Sarah is going to have the same password, but Sarah is 15, size 15. And I'm going to have another person named Steve and that password is 1234, but Steve is size 35. And uh, we're going to finally have uh, Jacob and Jacob is size five. So we're going to have a bunch of people here. And the purpose of creating all these people, once again, is kind of to mimic a database call, right? So this is, we'll call it, we'll label this end of database call. Now, once again, this is just to mimic what I'm going to get back from a database. So you can imagine that currently in my database, I might have four people and I'm going to grab all of these people. And that is going to be stored in a list called users. All right, so let's say now my intent is to show all of these people or display all of these people in some way. So the next thing we're going to have to add is we need to inject a model into this get mapping. And what a model allows us to do is in place of users, we're going to be able to have a model type, which I can send over to my templates a little bit later on. So I'm going to type in model. Okay. And model is going to come from org spring framework UI. Okay. So I'm going to call this model. Okay. So this is just a variable called model. And notice once again, we've added the or spring framework UI. And now I'm going to do model dot add attribute. And I'm going to add a name to this. So whatever name I'm going to use in my template, I'm just going to put it here as a string. So let's call it us. Okay, so just just to differentiate this variable, although it could just as e easily be called users. But for now, we'll just call it us. Okay, so us is going to represent our users. So we're going to take our users and we're going to put it into an, a model and we're going to send it to our view. So that's basically what we're doing in these two lines of code. So imagine that we have this list of users that later on we're going to grab from a database. We're going to send the, these users over to the template. And now this template's job is to take this data and just show everybody that's in this list. So now I'm going to jump over to show all, and I'm going to write some code in order to display all of these people. Now I'm going to write this code in, in such a general way that it will work whenever I have a list of people to print out. And for this, we're going to use a dependency called time leaf. So the first thing we'll do is just so that we can display things a little bit better. I'm just going to copy over a link for bootstrap. And I want us to go back and make sure that in our palm.xml that we have indeed imported the dependency time leaf. Okay, this time leaf is a template engine that will allow us to be able to display HTML files from our endpoints. Here, you'll see that if I do a save, once again, the, the server is going to restart itself. Right now, our template is just showing a blank body, but let's add a few things to it. So the first thing we'll do is do a main tag. And because this is a bootstrap site, I'm just going to call this a container. And I'm also going to call it fluid. So it's a container fluid. All right, so that's our main container. I'm also going to create another div, which has a class name of row. So this is going to become our row. And uh, just to specify a little bit more, we're going to do justify content center. So this is going to center our content. And then we're going to do another div that is going to be a column medium four. So this bootstrap, uh, all these bootstrap classes I talked about in an earlier video. So basically this is a container with a row that has a column that has four columns to it, or sorry, that has a row that has four columns to it. So inside of this, I'm just going to create an H1 tag that says users. And we're going to do an unordered list and an unordered list is uh, inside. We're going to have a bunch of list items that just lists out our users. Now, similarly, we could also do a table. I think table is typically the better way to go, but just for this demo, I'm, I'm a little bit lazy. So I'm just going to do an LI for every person that exists in the data that's coming in the, the U S that's coming in. Okay. So we had a U.S. Uh, attribute that's coming in and we want to be able to display all of those U.S.'s. So here's where we can really see the powerful nature of time leaf. So in the attributes of the LI, I can give TH colon, which stands for time leaf. And time leaf has a bunch of programming structures that we can use. If you're interested in knowing all of these programming structures and all of the things that you can do in time leaf, please take a look at the reference that I have down in the description. Uh, but one of the things that we can do in time leaf is there is an each structure. So TH colon each is going to allow us to enter some for loop. So this is kind of like a for each loop. So I'm going to say user. So this is my variable user uh, US. So this uh, dollar sign and squiggly line is actually taking in a variable that we have that's brought in from our model. So basically what this line does is I'm going to iterate through each of the users the, in the US data and each one I'm going to call it user. 
Okay. So in our case, we're going to cycle this four times, but let's say your database has 10 items. It will cycle through it 10 times. And for each of these users, I want to add a span tag. And let's say the first span tag, I want to do th and then text. So th text allows me to be able to represent some text within the content of this span tag. So here again, we're going to give it the variable. So once again, we have the dollar sign and squiggly bracket. And this time I'm going to do user dot name. So I'm going to take the user, whatever the user is in this iteration, and I'm going to put the name there. All right, let's do a br tag. And so we'll go to the next line. I'm going to do another span. And again, I'll do a th text. And this time I will do the user dot password. I'll type in the password. And then finally, we're going to do another div. And uh, this is another tool that exists in Timeleaf. So for example, we can do a th switch statement. So a switch statement allows me to be able to print different things or have different elements appear on a page based on the, the variables that we're given. So for example, if I consider what the user.name is, and so if I want to figure out what, what is the user.name, and the user.name is going to have different cases. So maybe here I'm going to do a span, and I'm going to say th, and this time I'm going to say case. So in the case, so this is very much like a programming construct of switch, uh, switch statements. So in the case where it is Bobby, now notice a single, a single line here, right? So this is a string that we're referring to. So in the case of Bobby, then I'm going to have, uh, hey, uh, it's... The instructor something like this and uh, I can have different cases for different people as well so here we can say let's pretend that in another case we're looking for Steve so um, so maybe in the case of Steve we're saying uh oh it's Steve and maybe in all the other cases which is going to end up as a star right so in every other case maybe I'm gonna say uh, general user Anyways, hopefully you get the idea of what I'm trying to do here. I have switch statements and these switch statements can have many cases associated with them and each case can produce any elements that you want. So I think we have enough here. So I've actually printed out quite a bit here just to show you all of the features of Timeleaf. And again, if you want a full list of all the things that you can do in Timeleaf, please take a look at that reference that I have below. All right, so now notice that our server is currently running and instead of boots.html, I'm now going to navigate over to, let me just double check, we're going to navigate over to users slash view, All right? So we're going to do users slash view, and we're going to be able to see all of our users. And these users are actually printed according to the definitions that I have in this file. So this is actually the show all.html file that you're seeing. And this is the endpoint for users slash view. So notice that when it's Bobby, it says, hey, it's the instructor. When it is Sarah, it's a general user. When it's Steve, it says, oh, oh it's Steve and so on. Okay. So we have all of these printed out. Uh, I want to show you maybe one last thing here. So if I go back to the span tag over here, I'm going to do another time leaf. So just to show you that you can have uh, different constructs, different time leaf constructs inside of a given tag, uh, there is also a time leaf style, which allows us to change the style of a particular element. So here, let's say I define the font size. So notice that I have a string. So the single quote is a string. And I'm going to plus the variable that I'm taking from user.size. Okay, so remember, we, we had some sizes associated with each user. And I'm just going to plus, again, a string that is called pt. So this is a point, right? So the user was 15 point, then their font size for this element would be 15 point. So this is just one way that we can quickly add a style to each of the elements, once again, for just displaying everyone differently. So I'm just going to save this and refresh this. And you'll notice that uh, Bobby has, uh, I believe, 25, uh, 25 size. Steve was 35. Sarah was 15. And then Jacob, you can see, is 5. So this is just one way that we can add some style to our elements. Now, there's so much more that we can talk about for Timeleaf, uh, but instead, I want you to take a look at the reference that I posted in the description below. In the upcoming videos, we're actually going to do some more of these Timeleaf programming constructs. So that's all I have for this video. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video.